And I'm unmuted. Welcome, everybody, to yet another episode of Disruption Talks, where we invite top experts to discuss everything that concerns disruption, innovation, digital acceleration, winning strategies, and everything else that you've come to hear over the past 70 or so episodes of Disruption Talks. Today, joining us, we have a pleasure to host David Leis, the co-founder and managing director of Ecolytic. And Ecolytic provides a solution to educate consumers on managing their environmental impact of their banking, sustainability as a service, if you will. We've heard of banking as a service, software as a service, and today, sustainability as a service. David is joining us to talk about just that. Am I right? Good morning. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> we can also change the topic in the last minute, but uh, let's talk. To, let's stay with that. Oh, well. You know, uh, I'm just I'm just reading what LinkedIn descriptions and Crunchbase descriptions have to say uh, about. Here we go. Uh, about so, uh, you know, let's start with you. What's the backstory? How does David Lies become the co-founder and managing director of Ecolytic and speaks to me on the 6th of September? What's the backstory? What led you to where you are? No, it's a bit, it's a bit long story. I think that the, the, the hour doesn't, doesn't, it's not enough, enough we'll cover it. But uh, uh, let's start with the basics. So my background is actually in payments for the last 18 years now. Um, started in acquiring, um, may, later moved on into issuing, um, built a couple of startups in that area. And um, I took a bit of a break in 2015 and um, wanted to, well, go once around the world. Um, and I, I kind of ended up in Asia and um, I, I saw all of those beautiful beaches and um, I saw all of those trash flying around. And, you know, being a German, I, uh, my first reaction was, of course, uh, complaining. Why is no one cleaning up this stuff? <laughs> so, uh, well, because I had a bit of time, I was kind of looking into it. Why, why is it? Well, why is it a problem? And it was actually my, a little bit my, of my awakening into the entire topic of sustainability. And um, since then, I'm basically trying to combine both worlds, right? So my expertise in the payment world with uh, sustainability. And I think the, the missing link that, that happened back then was um, I try to understand a little bit of what is my personal influence on the environment. And I, I, I wasn't able to really understand it, to be honest. And, and I thought, okay, well, this, this may be a problem, right? If, if we all, I, I saw, my, you know, talking to friends and everyone's like, everyone wanted to do a little bit, but climate wasn't really a big problem back then. But it was a bit of a, um, a topic that, you know, here and there people heard about it and so on. And everyone's like, yeah, but, you know, what can we do about it? And I don't know actually what I can do. So uh, I was in the same situation and I tried to find a way of um, figuring out, first of all, what is my impact? And then second, what can I do in order to reduce it? And turns out payment data is quite a rich source of um, uh, helping and explaining a little bit of what is my day-to-day -day influences on the climate. And um, that was basically uh, the, the kickoff of a non-for-profit that we founded back then, um, the Organization for Sustainable Consumption, and a couple of years later then uh, Ecolytic. Okay. So now I got to ask you, other than special days like the time in June when you announced the fact. I think you're breaking up a little bit. Money or, or today when you're having this amazing interview, what does a regular some issues? Yeah, sorry. Did I we just I wasn't break up, but we're back. Yeah, I can hear you again. Okay, good. I was just asking, other than those special days like raising money or having interviews, what does a regular day uh, for the co-founder and managing director of Ecolytic look like? <laughs> uh, it's a busy day, usually. <laughs> so um, within Ecolytic, I mean, I have uh, four amazing co-founders and we kind of split it, uh, our, our, our responsibilities quite well. So for me, um, I'm taking care about product, um, impact and marketing. So there's kind of the core areas where, where my day starts and, <laughs> and ends with. Um, so I'm leading the product team. So primarily focusing on, you know, what is, what is we currently building? Where does the product can head to, et cetera? And um, at the same time, kind of, you know, seeing uh, what is the impact we generate through that product and, and in the industry we are. And the last one then is like, how can I market this into or bring it into the market and explain it to the world that 
what we do is actually a, a good thing um, with the team I have. So how does my day look like? Uh, usually 10 meetings a day and then, uh, uh, but let's start in the morning, right? I bring my son into the kindergarten and then I go to the office and then I have like 10 to 15 meetings. And then I, at some point I bring him to bed and then I start actually working on doing stuff. So uh, it's, it's busy, <laughs> but I think that's a good sign at the moment. It is, it is, it is. Um, so I also got to ask you a trick question. Uh, it's it's not an easy question, so to say. We have all this uncertainty in the market. You go on LinkedIn, you get hit with a post about layoffs, about inflation, yeah. about recession, about, you know, I don't know, everything just going rather yeah. down than up. So inspiring pessimism rather than optimism. What's on your mind today as a co-founder? What concerns you? Is it all just noise that you carefully pick apart and ignore? Is it something that actually drives you or drives you crazy? How do you manage the current situation? Um, I mean, I think it's, it's a little bit of everything, right? So, <laughs> um, I mean, we do, we do have fundamental problems, right? Um, who has thought a couple of hundred days back that there is actually a war happening right in the middle of, of, of Europe, right? Um, so I think no one, we, we do have an energy crisis. We do have an infl inflation um, and we see it with employees, right? Can we, can we raise maybe the salaries to kind of keep up with the demands that happening? Um, all kind of these topics are, are relevant. And at the same time, you know, there, um, especially if you look from a climate perspective, um, there's more to come, right? I mean, there's, there's climate disasters happening at the moment. We will, we'll see it now. Uh, there's a big water problem coming up. There is uh, a big demand in the food supply chain coming up. So um, it feels like it's just the starting point, especially in the field where we are, right, with climate and everything that we're constantly trying to explain the world, what we need to change. Um, so definitely, um, it's something that we need to watch closely and we need to watch um, the environment. And of course, as soon as the, the, the big parties of the last 10 years is over, when it comes to economy and constant grow, grow um, also the funding situation for startups will be get more difficult. Um, on the other hand, I think what happened over the last four to five years, especially in our field and, and you know, and let's call it the environmental um, in the, uh, field is, um, is remarkable because when, 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 when I started in 2015, really, in, the, in, the, in our industry, in the finance industry, when we talk about uh, um, sustainability, it was still a niche market, right? Most people thought I'm crazy kind of addressing this. We have other problems and there's how to make money with it and so on and so on. And that has completely changed. So I think it changed um, from, from many aspects. Um, regulators are being more strict and pushing in new, new legislations. Um, employees and consumers itself are being increasingly more aware of this topic. So movements like Fridays for Future have done a tremendous job of bringing this into the society. So everyone wants to do more and understands the problem of, of, of the climate crisis more. And I think this brings a new drive into it. So I think for us, what we can say at the moment is business is good because the interest is tremendous and um, we're, we're seeing so many good opportunities and deals coming up. Um, having said that, there are a lot of uncertainties, right? So if, 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 the, if a lot of more crisis hits the market, I think even banks will need to reprioritize and uh, not sure if, if climate topic is then the immediate next need of, of doing so. Um, I think it is actually because it helps to do this transition, right? There's a huge demand from consumers. There's a, a huge interest as well. Um, and, and you can take this. If you're a smart banker and a smart bank, you can you know you can take this interest and actually can guide you through rough days. Um, so from our perspective, um, really to, to make it short, I think we need to watch the market closely. And of course, there are a couple of concerns, but we hope it's it's an accelerator to this fast, more sustainable transition where we at the center at the moment. So I think um, we might have a real good chance to do good business over the next couple of, of months and years. And um, for the sake of all of us, right? So, yeah.
So when you say that this is an accelerator, it sounds like this is the the best situation you could find yourself in, uh, counterintuitively in some way. Well, it's hard to say yes, right? I mean, from a business perspective, the circumstances are good, right? But if you look from a society or even from 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 the environmental perspective, like the shitty situation we can be in, right? I mean, we should have tr do this transformation years, years ago, right? Now we just wait until the last end where actually it starts hurting. Um, but yes, it increases pressures. And for us, at least business-wise, this can be quite good. Diamonds created under pressure, of course. So back to <laughs> back to your company. Uh, tell me about it. Tell me what it is. What are the main drivers? Because of course, me just reading a description of your LinkedIn page or of your Crunchbase page doesn't do it justice. I'm pretty sure that you, as a co-founder, can tell us much more. All right, pressure's on. <laughs> um, so I think. What we try to do is really is think of us as an educational tool for consumers. Um, you know, the, the climate crisis is a very complex topic. And we as consumers are at the stage where we're saying, we want to do more. We want to know what is my influence and what can I change in order to, you know, be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And that requires a tons of education because it's a complex scenario. So what we do, basically, we take financial data, the payment transactions, for example, and use this as a foundation to uh, calculate your environmental impact and then help you to navigate around it, right? Is it is it a lot? Is it compared to others in your space or in being your, your comparison group? Uh, are, you, are you above, are you below the average? Um, what can you change in your day-to-day -day habits to actually reduce it? Um, what can what else can you do uh, to be actually part of the of the solution? So it's really um, we take the data which are already there for years within the banks and basically put them into new light and help you as a consumer understand where you are and what you can do. And um, we believe as a consumer you have basically like three options to be part of the solution. And the first one is um, you can change your behavior, right? So and that starts with eat a little bit less meat, maybe reduce it at all, um, leave your car back home and take public transport, um, you know, change your electricity providers, those kind of little things that at the end end up to be quite, um, quite tremendously in, in terms of impact. Um, but these are obviously the hardest one, right? So it's very comfortable going to my car in the morning instead of going to the next bus station and take the bus. It, it, it requires a certain effort and um, those are the things that takes a little bit longer, but there are some smaller things that, that, that you can do um, which are also impactful, but a bit easier. So first one, changing your habits and your behavior into something that is more conscious um, around the environment. Um, the second one is we need to accelerate the transition to a more uh, renewable world. So easiest example is uh, energy, right? So we need to get rid of a bit more fossil fuels and really do the transition to renewable energies. That requires money. So if I'm as a consumer, do a conscious choice and saying, I'm going to switch my electricity provider to something that uses renewable energy. Well done. That's the first good choice. The second is, if I have a bit of spare money, um, why I'm not investing it into products that actually accelerate the uh, renewable energies, you know, investing into wind parks, solar power, et cetera, et cetera. And this is where banks suddenly say, well, there's a business model, right? So I have you as a consumer. I can tell you where you are, and then I can tell you where you can invest in, in order to find this transition. So there's a natural fit on the data that we have and what uh, also banks need to do in the future. Um, and that actually accelerates the entire adoption of it if I want to, you know, I do, I increase my impact by accelerating it and long term, I also make some interest, which is the either scenario. And the third one, um, even though it's a bit of, if it's a controversial topic, it's, it's offsetting. So, if I can change a certain amount of my through my behavior, I can change a little bit through accelerating. But at the end, um, our infrastructure has a quite high footprint, right? So even if I take the bus, um, most likely the bus runs with gasoline or diesel. So we need to change the infrastructure to be more, uh, you know, renewable or whatever the, the bus needs in order to 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 be uh, less influential on the environment, um, and. That means, you know, in order to use this, either through financing 
or through offsetting. And I think it's it needs to be part of the solution, but the market is a bit tricky, so it <laughs> also has a lot of backslashes. But these are the three options, right? Behavioral change, investing, and offsetting is what I can do immediately as a consumer. And um, that drives, uh, obviously, markets, um, hopefully in a more sustainable direction. OK. I think you also sort of covered my next question that I wanted to ask, which is how is sustainable banking different today than when Ecolytic started? You basically. Uh, Sort of, sort of touched upon that. Uh, I think it's also very, uh, very interesting what you mentioned about the comparative factor of where you are between, uh, between uh, other yeah. other users and uh, other other consumers. Uh, especially this, they they say that comparison is the thief of joy in some sense. And also with with ESGs, actually, it's been this interesting thing that you know Tesla wasn't mentioned as an ESG driven yeah. company, but Exxon Mobil was purely on the basis that ESG is being evaluated on where a company lies within its industry, right? By by proportion, essentially. So that's also a very interesting thing when it comes to this comparative factor, either between companies or consumers and uh, everything, really. Um, so, of course, Ecolytic is the best when it comes to sustainable banking. No doubt about that. But what are some good examples of sustainable practices in banking that you've seen outside of your own yard, so to say? I think banking is huge, right? I mean, um, of course, what we do with, with, with this education factor, I think, adds a lot of uh, elements to it. But honestly, um, we need to talk about investments, right? We need to do with the transition in it. We need to talk about... Uh, ESG and, and regulations and building standards and um, ESG isn't the solution either, right? So we need to, there's, there's a tons of things that we need to talk and my, my favorite topic is actually data. Um, we need to make more data available and that is not just in banking, it's, it's the entire world, right? So in order to really build um, a transparent supply chain, every company needs to strip down. It's like, this is what I'm doing. This is my influence. And this is the calculation I've done. And please now uh, work with this. Um, but this is, requires a shift, right? Because uh, uh, we have this um, over the last 20 years or 30 years of digitalization, we, we kind of learned, you know, data has value. It has, um, but only few companies can actually monetize it. And uh, most companies are still like, okay, I have this valuable thing. I don't understand it, and I don't know how to make money with it. But it's I, I learned it's valuable. And then on the other hand, I have like the uh, data privacy regulations, which are really important, and saying that is kind of restricting me to do whatever I do with this data. So I rather not touch it, and I rather not make it public because I might be in trouble or I give something away that's valuable. Um, and that's a problem because sustainability requires um, transparency. And without giving a certain amount of data, uh, meaning, you know, where is your impact on the environment? Um, we don't know. We cannot build this transparent supply chain. So we cannot get better than that. So we kind of need to break through this barrier and saying, hey, yes, your data is valuable. And it had the biggest value it has actually is uh, when we talk about sustainability. So make it available. And then um, you contribute basically on a larger scale, even without not directly monetizing maybe on it um, at the moment. It's very interesting that I'm actually here in a, in a hotel just slightly below Warsaw. I was attending a conference that was to do with beauty products and cosmetics and the entire industry. And copy paste what you said was being said yesterday with regards to transparency, supply chain visibility. Yeah everything else just replacing the industries between finance and uh, and beauty and actually there was this uh, pretty clever idea but of course just like you said it's it's difficult to have transparency and not uncover too many of your business secrets of the secret sauce right of uh, that if you provide uh, uh, insight into your supply chain on blockchain on a ledger then that gives you absolute transparency and you can basically see where things do work out and where things might be not that clear as expected. Um, so when you mentioned that, if, if I'm not mistaken, you just said that ESG is not the way. Um, I wanted to ask what are the biggest ESG challenges of the finance industry, but just judging from that sentence, I'm hearing that ESG itself is a challenge. Can you, can you expand? Can you correct me if I'm wrong? Just uh, broaden my horizon here, please. I think... Um... 
well, I wouldn't say ESG is the wrong way, but I think um, there's this huge misperception that ESG stands for sustainability measurements, right? So if you if you talk, even average consumers are sometimes sh shockingly, even bankers, like, hey, well, what are you doing in ESG? Yeah, yeah, we do a lot of sustainability and the answer is always ESG. Um, well, the, the misperception is basically ESG is um, a risk measurement framework for companies, right? And it's not necessarily looking into what's the risk for the environment that's happening with this company. So think of you buying a house, right? The seller of this house might have a different view than you as a buyer, right? So the seller says, you know, always taking good care of it and it's absolutely fine. The house is great, whatever. But you look at the house and think, hmm, actually in the next couple of years, I might need to do the roof and actually I want to tear down this wall, et cetera, et cetera. So the price for this house for you is a different one than obviously for the seller. And I think it's this different perspective, right? So ESG looks at the seller perspective and saying, hey, this is the risk I have within my house. And if you want to invest into this house, you know, this is, this is what I can manage. But there's no one actually outside and saying, hey, this is the risk of the environment or social that's happening with what the company does. And so there's actually no framework out there that really looks on the environmental risk of certain companies. And this is where I say ESG is not the solution because we need new measurements. We need new measurements and saying, hey, we need to give nature a, a voice and saying, hey, this company is certainly not good for me. So full stop, because of X, Y, Z. The company turns around and says, according to ESG measurements, you know, I can handle the risks on the environment and social and so on and so on, which if I want to invest into this company, this is a good indicator to have, right? but it does not necessarily re, um, reflect the risk from a nature or environmental standpoint. Um, and I think this is a big misconception because I think this is, if you break this through, it's good, right? We need new measurements. We need new standards. Um, sometimes you meet in between. I think it's another problem of ESG is that there's a lot of frameworks, um, standards, whatever it is, but there's nothing fully agreed that the world actually relies on yet, which means, um, you know, some were looking a bit more into the risk of the environment, some were looking more into the risk of the of the company. Um, and then it creates this gray mass of, well, it has to do something with social and sustainability. But it's a bit risky. So I think, um, yes, ESG is a good one, um, but it's just a starting point. Um, I think it shifts a lot of knowledge into it, um, but we need new measures um, for the environment and social aspects as well. I'm actually seeing that in the comments we have uh, Kimanshu who's saying this side from Thea Ventures, a climate tech focused fund. So really glad to have, uh, really glad to have that. Perhaps you know your next uh, your next round can be found in our comment section. Let's cool. uh, Kimanshu, <laughs> make sure to connect afterwards. Um, okay, so I also have a question in the comments from our CEO. Um, mm -hmm. I. I would, I would politely request our team to put it up. Uh, hi, David. Great to see you here. I'm wondering, apart from being able to assess the footprint of the daily shopping of your customers, giving them the possibility to offset it, how successful are you with changing their actual habits? Uh, do you observe positive trends in their spending habits after using your app? As in, is it like, uh, you know, before and after with the supplements that make you thinner? Is there like a before and after with Ecolytic that basically users have certain habits before and after six months, it's magic? Yeah. Um, well, it's not magic. <laughs> For oh, sure not. Um, but what we can see is actually there's, um, it depends a little bit on the on the groups and so on, but what we can clearly see that there's a shift of behavior. So we see on, on, on most of our um, banking implementations, we see a spread of around 10%, which means spendings of the card goes up, CO2 goes down. And the reason is um, we see that consumers are focusing more on conscious consumerism. And that usually means, you know, if you go to, a grocery store that is well known for, you know, um, organic products, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of those products have actually um, factored the environmental cost in it already, right? So if I buy, some, buy something that is really organic and fair trade, et cetera, I have all of the social costs and I have the environmental costs within the product and the product price, which means the spending goes up, 
and CO2 goes down, which is very interesting. Um, and we see this in average by what was so what we see is an average of consumers are actually able through behavioral change to reduce their footprint by roughly 10%. Depends a little bit on the market and depends a little bit on the bank, um, but this is this is what we can see and this is very exciting. And um, what we currently do, we put all of that into uh, a framework, which we will also public soon, where we can actually um, quantify the behavioral change in terms of CO two. So. Um, spoiling here a little bit of the next product uh, roadmap, um, which means we can actually um, really measure the differences that someone has taken from um, you know, applying our solution, start doing a bit more conscious spending, and then um, the CO2 saved um, can be quantified and measured. And we can actually um, tell you, you know, David, because of your, uh, you left your car back home a little bit more um, because of your grocery shopping spending, et cetera, et cetera, you actually reduced your footprint by X. Um, and that will be very exciting. So yes, we see it. We, we don't, we not only see a trend, we actually see that uh, it works. Yeah. Uh, David, I got to tell you, I always love, uh, unexpected product announcement release feature <laughs> uh, feature product or anything that are really people display on disruption talks i also see that we have another question uh that is building on top of what you just said from mm -hmm. paulina it reads from the environment perspective having people consume less fly less off and etc results in a lower carbon footprint but after all banks and payment organizations earn commission on each transaction thus more transactions, bigger the income. I'm wondering, how do you combine two different needs and convince customers to add tools to their apps, which may limit their revenue streams? Mm, true. I think, um, well, and that's the beauty of the answer, right? What we really see is the spread. So CO2 goes down, spending goes up because co consumers are spending more conscious and more conscious usually means the environmental and social facts are uh, priced into the products. So, you know, buying... I don't know, uh, a, a good fruit of vegetable from, from, from a grocery store, um, you know, a discount or something like that versus one that actually factors all of those aspects in is usually a huge price difference. So um, it, most we get a discretion a lot from banks, um, but when we show them our statistics, um, they're actually surprised how, how big the spread is because people want to spend more as long as they know they have a positive effect. Um, and I think that that's the good news. And the other thing is, um, uh, I think it's this this way of transition, right? I mean, if you, um, as a consumer, I want to do something, and if I if my bank is actually offering me choices, I, I most likely opt in, right? So changing electricity bill is one thing, but if I can actually accelerate the renewable adoption by investing into it, and my bank's offering me that, and it's part of the entire deal. Um, I, we see that consumers tend to follow this because they like that there's suddenly, uh, you know, two parties working together. I give you my money and I see the positive effects of it while you helping me building the transparency of the things that I usually do through my day-to-day -day shopping. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's a fear that we often get, but uh, statistics shows actually it's the opposite. Okay. And at least for now, just the last question from the audience, because they just went one, two, three, like in a boxing match. The last one comes from Dominica, and actually it shakes the foundation of everything that we're talking about a little bit. There has been a lot of discussion related to overestimated CO2 offset certificates delivered by third parties. How do you make sure their CO2 offset is transparent? How do you yeah. basically make sure that when you set up the name of the game that we will create such an environment so that payments influence CO2? But actually, how do you make sure that that CO2 is true to form? That 101, what you hear about what you're offsetting is actually what you're offsetting. Yeah. Um, so it's a difficult topic, um, but I can tell you how we can tackle it. So f first of all, I think we as a company following the principle of radical transparency, which means uh, our methodology on how we calculate CO2 is right from the beginning open source. Everyone can look into, we have built a community around it to constantly help us improving it. Um, there's soon the second version to be published, which basically learns it over the last three years we have put into a new framework, um, which is 
thousands times more complex that we originally come up with, but it's, I think it's the next evolution step. Um, the second part is we actually don't work with offset certificates or offsets uh, in that in the traditional sense. So we work with the project builders directly and we only work with non-for-profits. So we allow our consumers to offset their footprint by doing a donation to a non-for-profit um, that has project builders on site. And um, the reason is uh, twofold. First of all, we want to make sure we, we cut the middleman because there's a lot of margin to be added on top of it of cert certificates. The second one is um, we believe donations are easier to understand for consumers, right? The, the concept of a carbon certificate is pretty boring, to be honest. Like I, I give you 50 bucks and then suddenly I get a paper and says, oh yeah, you offset one ton. And I have no idea how big that is or what it feels or whatsoever. But, you know, showing how projects do it by, you know, reforestation, um, uh, forest and so on and so on. And, and, and you can see p pictures, you can see how they work. You can see the progress over the last years. You can see the social aspects of this. This kind of makes it more um, relatable. It kind of makes it give you a better understanding on how they do it. And that's why we said, okay, let's, concentrate purely on donations at the beginning. There will be a shift to offsets at some point as well, because we see some markets are more lean it and also, you know, some combined products make sense. And this is where we really partner with um, yeah, one of the leading uh, institutions in the market to really make sure we have the best quality we can get. Having said that, the market is not flawless. So there are a couple of hurdles that they need to overcome as well. Um, but we always say, well, this is where we need partners to work on the uh, voluntary carbon markets. We try to work with the best um, and help them, but uh, our our business stops there, right? So we just be the facilitator. And again, we explain how these things happen and we explain it to consumers as well. And we've been completely radical transparent on, on how it works and, and where the stuff is coming from. And um, you as a consumer has the ultimate choice to make. Um, but now you can do a educated choice and not just believing marketing, blah, blah. Speaking of marketing, blah, blah, that's exactly <laughs> what I wanted to, to, to go into with my next question is, Typically, there is this uh, unspoken expectation that when a company is, is is a good company, is a company that is focused either uh, business model wise or in terms of its branding, in terms of how it's perceived that it's a, it's a good company, those expectations of being the guardian angel of the situations typically don't have boundaries. You're just if you if you're good, everything that you do has to be good and helpful. Mm -hmm. And if there's something that you dare to just do as a regular company sometimes it's like well weren't you supposed to be a good company and this is this is here what i wanted to ask because we speak of sustainable banking is there an expectation that sustainable banking also addresses somehow underserved communities because of course it's not just the environment but, but is there a different angle a different focus when it comes to sustainability plus underserved communities yeah i think it's, it, it all goes hand in hand. And I think you're right, right? There's this, this um, you're, you're an impact driven company. So everything we do is, 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 is impact driven and is perfect. Well, we try to, <laughs> but also for us, a lot is a learning curve, right? I mean, we um, also, we have processes where we look into and saying, well, we need to increase our impact on this, or we need to tackle certain elements of it, right? I mean, there's, there's some, some good examples on, you know, salary transparency, for example, how do we build this up? Um, um, gender pay gap. Um, we have built a lot of um, policies internally to address all of this. Are we perfect in it? I actually don't know, right? It's just a process. And I think we're working with the feedback and so on and so on. Um, and I think it's the same with, with, with underserved communities. Um, it's, it's, diff it's difficult. I mean, it's, it's yes. Uh, is it, is it directly our sweet spot now? Um, not really when it comes to a business. I mean, yes, we are addressing certain elements of it, but um, I think there, there are other fintechs out there which are doing a much better job when it, when it comes to you know, making payments more accessible, banking more accessible, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is not necessarily what we do. I think where it, where it comes 
where where we have an effect on it is with our employees, the way we deal with our partners, et cetera, et cetera. But we always try to make sure we 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 give underserved communities a voice. But you know, even in our talk today, we fail. Well, we, we're we're 100% man in this talk, so. Uh, uh, we 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 need to have. I mean, we have we have two amazing women in the background that are actually supporting us, right? So I mean, this is the way worth mentioning here. Um, that uh, w whatever we say here, it's 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 uh, maintained or um, actually big help was was two amazing women. But I think in that perspective, someone of us needs to be female to actually help the un I wouldn't say underserved this is this is not a wrong wording um but it, you know what I mean Ad address the problem um of that so uh yeah um and definitely shout out sense. to Yuki and, and shout definitely. out to Zofia so uh on both uh, sides of Ecolytic and NetGuru and here I wanted to uh, pull the string that you just just showed a second ago. Um, we spoke about ESGs. I'm pretty sure that people are aware of of the Cobra effect, the perverse incentive, the the story where you had uh, um, the situation. It's it's an anecdotal story, of course, in in India during the British rule that the British government was concerned about the number of venomous cobras in Delhi. And they offered a bounty for every dead cobra. And initially, this was a successful strategy. But over time, actually, people got into the business of uh, breeding cobras for income. Mm -hmm. uh, and here, speaking of this perverse incentive, has ESG become hijacked by investors or by people who have this as a as a goal that they have to reach? Uh, definitely, and I think it 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 has been because of this wrong perception, right? If you go out there and say, ask a, the average consumer, have you heard about ESG? And most likely, they either say no, or they say, oh yeah, this is the sustainability thing, right? So there is this perception saying, oh, ESG means this is something that has to do with sustainability, um, which opens the door for well a lot of fraud because you know i can suddenly label uh, any kind of bullshit for uh, painted uh, green because um, people think i do something for the environment but actually i'm just managing my risks when it comes to the environment um, so there's a misperception and i think it's it's being misused however at the same time more and more money getting pulled into the industry shades or shades light on on what's happening there which means a lot of investors also turn around saying wait a minute this i i need to ask for more things right i need to ask for certain impact reports and to ask for certain other stuff so it it kind of um drags the problem on stage and i think that's a good that's a good scenario because then we we finally find the time to talk about how we can do it better so how do we fix it? How do we bring back the original values of, of, of the ESG that were there when it was being developed? Uh, especially that the originally intended factors were the ones that were supposed to help the end customers say, I want to do business with you. I don't want to do business with you. So voting with money. So voting with the most efficient voting tool. Yeah. Honestly, I think the, the the for me, um, but I'm I'm not an ESG expert. I have to say that. So, but uh, for me, I think it's transparency. So, if if I if if companies are getting enforced, and this is happening a little bit with the taxonomy now, to actually publish their their environmental or reports or carbon accountings, whatever you want to call it, um, it it helps me already to decide a little bit more. Okay, this is this is the influence a company has uh, in terms of carbon. It's one good metric to, to look at it. Um, and if they start publishing those numbers, it becomes more obvious, right? Because then we're not talking about how they handle the risk. We're talking about this is an absolute number they're actually producing. And now I can start comparing them through other peers in their in their group and saying, all right, this is, I don't know, this is a coffee shop that does X and this is a coffee shop that does Y. And and um, one is, is, is way better than the other. So I'm I can do a conscious decision to go to that one that is uh, already uh, doing the best, right? So I think this is this is the next trend anyway, and it will happen, um, and we need to accelerate it because it solves so many problems um, as well. So I think that's the only, not the only, but this is one of the most powerful um, things we can do is actually building this transparency. Um, and honestly, I think for businesses, it's a good thing as well, right? So if I... 
if I want to do something and I generally want to do something and I can start telling my story on how I can change things and I can document it with actually the numbers I, I can prove of, um, then I build up trust because I'm not behind the marketing blah, blah anymore. I can show pure numbers and statistics and saying, this is the journey I'm taking on. And I think um, when we talk about greenwashing and all of this stuff, I think consumers are looking behind the curtains more and more and they're losing trust to certain brands. But by showing what you do in terms of numbers, you can rebuild this trust and it's more powerful than any green packaging that your marketing might come up with. And you just used the word trends. And this is something I wanted to perhaps free us just from sustainable banking, although you get to give me an answer that goes right back to sustainable banking. What is an innovation or upcoming trend, anything in the banking, payments, anything concerning money sector that you are excited about? Either something that we're seeing already flourish or something that you are forecasting that's going to become a big thing. Uh, you know, just like... Tell me about it as if you were telling me 10 years ago about blockchain in a similar in a similar fashion. Whew, that's a difficult one. But I think it, it, for me, it really, it, it brings back to data. And I think um, what I see is this trend of really carbon accounting, um, which means you know businesses are actually sitting down and trying to measure their emissions um, on a larger scale as, as a business side. And then they're trying to publish it or you know, following the EU taxonomy, some businesses need to publish it or at least needs to report about it um and i think there's uh, it, it the, the, why it's not because of this carbon accounting process per se because it's i think it kicks off a process internally to actually gather the information of the company where do i have impact and then as soon as you start going down this rabbit hole there's no way back anymore because you know uh, suddenly you need to ask your suppliers and saying hey by the way i need some numbers from you because otherwise i cannot finish my report and then uh, suddenly suppliers that never have been forced to do anything about this needs to do it because they don't want to lose the customer right so i think it it, it starts this this positive wildfire effect where where you know it starts with the big ones, but they're dragging it down to the smaller ones. And then suddenly all people need or all businesses need to basically being confronted with what is my impact in terms of carbon. So carbon can only be the starting point. But while we implement all these tools and measurements, I think it will be easier to add other metrics on top. Um, but it, it kicks off this process. And I think... Um, that is what makes me so excited about it is that, you know, we finally found a market effect where there's a benefit because corporations and businesses are seeing if I publish this, consumers will like it, consumers will trust me more, consumers will, uh, you know, value my brand higher. And at the same time, I'm dragging with me all of my suppliers that don't want to be part of it because they thought they'd get around it. But now suddenly they're uh, in the middle of it. Um, and I think this this trend or this movement is is what excites me most. Okay, so I'll paint you this picture uh, and and come with me, please, into the future. Let's say that we do enough of the effective marketing, blah blah, so that we actually don't have blah blah, but actual results and. Over time, I believe that we will, as humanity, manage to escape this, uh, uh, the bad, fighting the good, and so on and so forth. And eventually, we might become so efficient with technology, with being proactive, with not solving problems, but actually proactively avoiding them, that there will be a healthy planet, that we won't have the context of what can we offset? How bad can we allow the temperature to rise? But at some point on the on the matrix, we will be able to have such innovation and eradicate solutions that basically impact the, the, the environment negatively. Um, do you believe in such a future? Do you think that this is something we might see in our lifetime? Or let's say our kids will be able to see that? I really think that on technological front, there is a space where we become so efficient with the things that fix what's broken and remove what is broken to a point where actually, you know, our grandkids will be hearing from their parents about 
the fact that there used to be a time where we had to track carbon footprints and we were concerned if the planet won't get too hot but now dear child that is no longer a concern yeah i i let me let me phrase it that way i i would love to believe it's such a future um and i don't think technology will solve it to be honest i think technology I mean, technology is a tool right and um you can use it for doing good things you can use it for doing bad things and the choice is up to us and I think this is where the problem lies, right? So um, we, I think we as a as humanity have failed. We have, I mean, we have a tremendous success when it comes to technology and acceleration of those things and and, and building up wealth. But if you look at, at if you really zoom out, um, we as we as humans still have a couple of fa things that we we're facing, and they're primarily social topics. Right. So I think um, and so if we're talking about technology and you're giving it to someone who has only bad intentions, um, who most likely will use it only for bad intentions. And I think as long as we're not getting um, on the society level and saying, hey, you know, my needs are as equal as your needs. And we're just the two of us in this call now. Um, then we, we will have a problem. Right, and um, I think this is where we have still a long way to go. And yes, technology might, sorry, save for my language, save our ass at some point, at some in, in some situations. But honestly, it's a tool, and um, we need to learn to handle it um, the way we should. And I think looking at things like the war, or even you know, economic crisis boiling up, and and how. Um, countries are suddenly being big friends are suddenly becoming not so much friends anymore it's just it's just a good mirror of um how we have to do some big big leaps as society to actually uh solve this so if you ask me i mean i have a son i would love to have him a really good future and that's why uh i i am i'm 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 having or building up what i'm building up with my with 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 all of our great team but um yeah, it, it's not just us, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's everyone that's listening, it's everyone in this world, um, it's up to everyone to, to build a, a world we want to live in. So basically the first place to clean up is here. Exactly, <laughs> yes, yes. And for our listeners on the podcast, by saying this, I meant our heads, basically make sure <laughs> that this is sustainable first and then you get to point your fingers everywhere else in the world. Um, another audience question from Zofia. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about your eco action product? How do you choose the initiatives for the program and how can the users check what positive impact their offsetting has done? Yeah, um, it's really um, it's really about, you know, we're working with partners and project builders. So we select uh, projects that we see has a, a high impact and we have some internal guidelines and rules on how we do this. Um, and then we're just trying to really work with the best that we find. Um, but I'm happy to share some afterwards sharing some 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 internal guide rules on how we do this. Um, but this is it's a long list of things that need to be applied for it. Um, that that has an effect on this. Yeah. Okay. So I will be moving to the last question that I have. So, dear audience members, if there's anything else from you, please. This is the final boarding call. Uh, my question is a magic one question. It's a question that we ask to all of our guests but there is no right or wrong answer. There's just your answer. So I hand you this remote, virtual, non-existent magic one. It's so magical that you can't even see it. Uh, <laughs> if you could cast a spell, if you could abracadabra the world such that every 12-year-old is given the gift of education on what topic? That is the question. What topic, what knowledge what wisdom is being transferred into the brains of every 12 year old in the world we've heard emotional intelligence we've heard design thinking we've heard financial education we've heard leave the kids alone they're 12 year olds uh so there's always the answer that is true to you and your why is what i'm looking for here um i think it's uh handle your ego or get in touch with your ego. And the reason is, you know, we, 
we, we, we tend to see the world from our perspective and that's absolutely fine because we build our universe around it and so on and so on. And um, I think our society brought us into a, a situation where we learn uh, you can become anything you want as long as you work hard, you be smart, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that means, you know, you get a good job, you get a good pay, then you can afford a new house and then a good car. And if you grow and then you can buy a new car and so on. So we are very much driven into things. But I think what we forget is um, we're not alone and um, we need to consider our uh, society, our community, into all of our considerations that we do. And I think climate crisis is kind of highlighting this very, very much, right? So um, I have my choices matter. And, um, but there are sometimes against the things that I actually want, right? So uh, I have to do sacrifices for the larger society or community that I'm, I'm within. Um, and I think we, we, we never really learned that um, when we are going through school. We never really learned the consequences above our own universe or beyond our own universe. And I think this is something that um, we need to teach our children. It's like, yes, take care of yourself, but in a strong community, you as an individual will always be stronger. And I think this is, um, it has to do with your ego. And it means sometimes you prioritize others and other well-being before your own. And sometimes um, others will do the same with you. And sometimes you look for yourself. But uh, if we balance this right, we wouldn't have an economic crisis. We wouldn't have wars. We wouldn't have uh, the climate crisis. So um, if we can do the spell. I think that that would be my, my wish. Okay, I think that you also agree that you know sometimes because whenever we use ego, it sounds like something that's extremely intentional. That's uh, that's mm. selfishness is an active thing, whilst yeah. it isn't always. Uh, I have to right. give the only shout out I can give to my experience with the educational system. There is only one one class that I have respected and loved always in the international baccalaureate program in high school, and it's been called theory of knowledge. How do you know what you know? Question yourself, question your own assumptions. It starts with this famed video, perhaps you've seen it yourself, how there's a group of people throwing the basketball between each other and there's the gorilla just passing through the background. And most of the people oh, yeah, don't yeah. Even the gorilla because you're being asked the question of how many times was the ball being passed? Yeah. And basically yeah. every student gets humbled at the very beginning because like, none of you notice the gorilla. So now you're going to listen and we're going to tell you how people are playing with your brains and doing things to you and the way yeah. you think. And likewise here, I just wanted to agree and add on what you said that the ego isn't always a thing that, you know, I, I wake up and I decide to be selfish. It's a way that you're sort of conditioned by your circumstances, right. by your context to, to think yeah. a certain way. And there is one 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 late guest to our flight i was announcing the boarding call and we have one last question from the audience uh rafa asks the following question how can you make your business model sustainable there are a number of companies in the business of estimating their co2 footprint based on card spend mastercard and visa are constantly improving apis allowing this what's your plan to win with potential competitors Good question. Um, I think the, 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 the biggest one is um, we have a very strong partner network, uh, including Visa. So if Visa is constantly improving the APIs, it's uh, partially because of us as well. Um, so I think this is kind of the, the, the biggest win in this. Um, second of all, I think it's, um, we're just starting, right? I mean, I always joke about and saying, if we really succeed, our business isn't sustainable because at some point we become obsolete. Right? because we have educated the world that knows how to do it. And, and here we go. So we are going out of business. Um, that's a long way. And I'm happy if that happens at some point, because then uh, we, we achieved our goals. Um, but I think it's, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, the, the principles we are following is really radical transparency. That means uh, we open source all of our scientific findings. 
Um, we, we have a very strong uh, community approach when it comes to the scientific world. We're inviting them and doing a lot of more research also on our platform. Um, we have a very, very strong uh, payment um, background and influence as well. So we have really good, amazing partners that are using us as as, as, as this background tool to, to, to basically provide their footprinting. Um, and funny enough, I mean, a lot of the startups that are popping up are actually using our open standards. So um, I've, it's not the first time I've come across a pitch where they actually reference our own model, which I, I, I always love to see because it sees, you know, there's a growing ecosystem out there and um, it's, it, it's growing and, and people are actually value the work that we have done. So um, I'm... I'm very optimistic looking into, uh, you know, uh, looking into our comp competitors and and how we do. And honestly, I I would love to work more with our competitors as well because I think uh, one of some of the biggest problems that we have is, is lack of standardization. I would love to standardize our work. Um, I would love to, uh, you know, calculation. How do we do the offsetting part right? Um, how do we get people to share more their data? It's all of the problems that all of our competitors has, right? So I think there's tremendous space to actually collaborate and um, the market is big enough. So um, I believe in competition and I think um, being more open, um, driving some of those topics um, will always set us apart a little bit. Um, at the end, time will tell if we would do a good job or not, but um, I'm very optimistic. As you should be. And with that being said, we are wrapping up today's episode. We are uh, more than thankful. First and foremost, I admit your remark was very on point to Yuki and Zofia for coordinating this and making this possible. To our beloved audience, all of the questions, uh, Everybody who, even though they haven't asked a question, has watched this. And David, to you for being a wonderful guest speaker. And for you too, Philip. Thank you for having me. Um, that was a lovely talk. And um, maybe in a couple of years, we look back and see where we are. I think I'm going to be hearing about you much, much sooner. Anyway, <laughs> thank you, everyone. And see you on almost every Tuesday in every year, uh, every Disruption Talks. Uh, we're also coming up with... Uh, uh, physical event coming soon more to be announced in our socials stay tuned and see you at least next week thank you